Good morning everybody, my name is Julia Peyton jones and I'm delighted to welcome you to Tea with Julia. Today I'm talking to Valeria Napoleoni, who is an art collector and a patron. She's Head of Development Committee at Studio Voltaire, a trustee of the Contemporary Art Society, on the Board of Trustees of New York NYU's Uni Institute of Fine Arts, a member of NYU's President's Global Council, on the advisory board of the Association of Women in the Arts and AIR Gallery in NYC. Valeria Napoleoni XX was launched in 2015 as an umbrella platform for projects increasing the recognition of art practices by contemporary artists. Valeria Napoleoni XX has ongoing collaborative projects with the Contemporary Art Society in the UK and the Sculpture Centre and the Institute of Fine Art in New York. Valeria is the recipient of the Mont Blanc Art Patronage Award 2019. Hooray! Morning, Valeria. How are you? You look absolutely spectacular. In Thank you. Tell me, tell me, what are you sitting in? What are you sitting on? I'm sitting on my uh, Amici chair by Gaetano Pesce. Gorgeous. My dear Gaetano. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, in, uh, in my study in, in, in the new house. Well, I mean, I've, with so much to talk about, I'm, I'm going to jump straight in um, and start by setting the scene, which is that you have 450 works in your collection by contemporary female artists. This is an incredibly significant number and a significant de demonstration also of your commitment, not only to the art of today, but also the art of today made by female artists. Firstly, why did you decide to focus on female artists? And have you ever made an exception to the rule? You've said Gaetano Pesce, for example, so that is an exception to, to the rule. Yes, well, um, my decision was, I tried to rationalize it many times because this is a question that comes up often. Um, but the best answer I can give you is that I've been uh, um, very sensitive to women issue and I'm, I'm a feminist, whatever it means nowadays. But when I started collecting in 1997, it was a 1997, yes. It was a very uh, specific time in, uh, for contemporary art. I was in New York City. Artists like Cindy Sherman and Barbara Kruger, just to name a few, were coming up to, uh, to you know, prominence. And I was really fascinated by their languages and their new, new, new ideas. And I was very excited about the work of a few other female artists. And um, also being conscious about uh, the fact that women were underrepresented in museums and commercial galleries. I think these three factors played play the rule in, uh, in, you know, very fluidly in my decision. Certainly it was not a strategy, but it was really something that came to me quite naturally. No, it's very, very impressive and very interesting. And I've got so many questions to ask. For example, have you ever collected a female artist who has made a historical contribution? For example, somebody like Hilma Klimt, Louise Bourgeois, for example, or Eva Hesse. I mean, I noticed that you have um, the work of Elaine Lustig Cohen, who of course is a, a seminal figure who died in 2016. So there are, would it be true to say that it's mostly contemporary, but on occasion historical? Well, I, I mostly, it's mostly contemporary, at least at the moment when I, when I, when I buy the work. Elaine, I was super lucky to have met her, uh, to have gone into her, townhouse on the Upper East Side in New York City, um, the year be two years before she passed away, unfortunately, and it, it was magical. But really for me, back then, when I started collecting her work, she was one of the contemporary figures I was looking at. So I don't go back historically because that would be a total another, another, another way to approach it. And also because I really, and very keen with their relationship with, uh, with artists, personal relationship with artists, and, um, and so to buy living, living artists, living figures. Because you talk often 
about your closeness to artists, how they become part of your family, and in a way you become part of theirs if they come and they come to dinner with you, but you also they come to stay. So it yes. feels as though that's a very immersive kind of relationship, but also conversation that you have with them. I mean, do they do you talk to them about your collection of artists, other artists that you're interested in? Do you seek their advice about who to collect? Yes, uh, we have. I have ongoing relationships and, uh, and discussion and dialogue with artists I buy. Also because most of the time uh, I meet them. You know, 99% of the time I go to the studio and eventually before buying the work, most of the time I, I have the chance to meet them. Of course, I become friends with more with some than others, but the relationship is there. And, uh, and I follow as much as I can their work. I support as long as I can the work. Uh, and yes, and they are my best advisor because they always come up with, with artists I should buy, I should know, I should learn about. Um, I don't use advisors, but artists are really among the people I listen to the most. Of course. But I mean, I'm thinking 450 connections. <laughs> well, amount. I think 450 works, but probably not 450 artists. Okay. They're really, I don't know, I, don't, I haven't had the chance to count the artists. <laughs> <laughs> but still, I mean, really, what a, what a, it's an extraordinary kind of mapping, if you like. Richard Wentworth always does these incredible maps of connections, and then you find, you know, that somebody that you only heard of, you in Transylvania you've met, you, you know, you're somehow connected. So I, I think it's a very fascinating idea, all those connections, conversations, and really inspirations. That's what we all, I think all of us in the art world, that's the thing that informs and feeds us, you know, what exhibition to go to, what studio to visit, what artists to talk to. And, and talking to artists is, is, of course, a privilege in any case. Absolutely. Yes, I mean, I, the, the journey I, I do, I've been doing for the past 23 years, it's a journey of discovery, it's a personal journey of personal growth, and also it's a journey with a lot of people. I'm not, I'm not navigating alone, and, and all this community and network, uh, but, you know, this web of support that I built throughout the years is very important to me and has allowed me to build a collection that I, I believe has quality, has consistency, and only through the help and the support of great artists, great galleries and curators, I could do that. And I strongly believe that you cannot build a, a, strong, a strong collection uh, alone. You, I mean, you need the support and you need um, the, the respect of people around you. No, of course. But you, oh, what is really remarkable that this considerable collection that you've amassed, cr created as well as curated, you have three homes, one in London, which is something you're working on now, so you're in the process of yes. creating this new place for you and your family to live, similarly in New York, and also Italy. So, these are your home. I was lucky enough to come to see your home where you used to live. You know, it's a Gazantkun's work. It's obviously, it's, it's a livable space. It, it's for you and your family. It's not a museum. So do you believe that art is best seen in a domestic environment or in a museum? Well, I think that private collections should be seen in domestic environment. I strongly believe that really private collection are private because it's a personal and individual journey uh, and vision of, 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 the, of the creative person who's putting it together. And um, I personally enjoy much more visiting private collection than not than going to museum, but it's totally a different experience and, and a different uh, um, attitude. So I... I think that the private collection should be, should be exposing the family to daily life and to be part of a daily life of a family. This is why also in, in, in our new, new home, but also in our previous places, I always um, 
I always created a strong presence of the art. And my family was always like, oh, mommy, but we are not really so keen on this. This is creepy. This is, or, and it was really not just the work. It was sometimes really challenging, but the presence was really major. And so art invades our domestic space and we have to negotiate that space with artists and with our art, artworks. And I think that is, uh, that is, you know, it's a good lesson for my kids to learn that contemporary art is about life and it's not just a piece to put on a pedestal so distant from us, but it's actually part of our daily discoveries and, uh, and, uh, and discussion about what life is. And how do, you, how do you decide when to choose pieces in your collection? So you have... Let's, let's say it's 450, it might be 430 or 470. Yes, it's yes, four plus. Four. So do you have a spreadsheet with all the works in your collection? I mean, it must be like, in a way, playing Monopoly. You move the pieces around the board, you see what they look like, mm -hmm. and go, oh no. I mean, okay. yes. And yes. how often? Do you have any rules that you live by? How do you structure it? Yes. Well, we have, uh, we have files. Uh, like, collection is all on file. We have really everything rec uh, on record and the images and all the documentation. So, yes, I, well, when I started uh, in, in the previous houses, we were always, um, you know, moving the collection very fluidly because we live with three kids and, <laughs> and we cannot leave the house to accommodate the installer for like, I don't know, days or you know, a week or, or so. So I, and pieces go to museums, come and go, come and go. And so really, and be doing it fluidly, uh, three, four times a year, we just change things around. It really keeps the space alive. It's yes. very challenging, but it's an incredibly creative exercise. As you say, moving, if you move a big piece in a room, the other pieces may not work around the new piece. So you have to re reconsider everything. And I love this exercise. So we do it organically and, and we will do it also in the new place organically. And and, but every piece, I want to experience every piece I buy. So every piece stays installed for average of three years, but pieces come and go at different time. So that's the way. And do, do the family contribute to the pieces they want to see? I mean, do you consult them? Because obviously, I mean, I know a little bit from experience that curating by committee is very interesting and exciting, but it has its challenges. Yes. <laughs> so how do you negotiate that? This is interesting. We have a family committee for art? No, we don't. But... But it's an open dialogue. For instance, now the kids in their, in their room have a say of what they want to install, yes. of course. And they also can say, I, I don't want anything. Uh, they haven't done that. But really, um, in terms of the, the main family spaces, it's me. Because I'm the only one who knows what we have, basically. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, and I get a lot of comments. Um, and for my husband, sometimes he says, oh, I don't understand why you're so keen on this work. I don't see so much. Uh, I don't know. And I always say, don't worry. The more you live with it, the more you will, you will connect to it and understand it and enjoy it, actually, and appreciate it. So things, when you live with, with artworks for a long time, there is this familiarity um, that comes into play that really makes you look at the work in a different way. Yes, uh, and I, it's one of the great privileges. I mean, this idea that you can go to a museum and stand in front of a work of art repeatedly and really get to know it, and it becomes sort of almost embedded in the very physical, the core of your being. Of course, if you live with that, then, then you have that extraordinary experience of passing it every day, getting to know it. Um, but I also wonder about you as a curator, which you clearly are. Do you do any curatorial projects outside your collection? No. <clears throat> um, well, if I curate, meaning curating, no. I mean, I have a lot of projects I'm involved with, with XX, my initiative. 
in support of female artists in museums and exhibition spaces, but I'm not uh, curating outside my home. It's true, it's an incredibly um, exciting and creative exercise. And, uh, and I have a twin sister, for instance, who is a, really a, a, a maker, a, a designer. And I think my creativity is expressed very much so uh, by curating the collection, choosing the pieces, choosing the work, and also curating the collection in the space that we live. My goodness, I mean, it's a, well, it's a full-time job, quite apart from anything it else, is. I imagine. But uh, it, yes, because you've chosen your house, which of course you know very well, in terms of structure, as opposed to doing it in a museum. But the principle is exactly the same, selecting works of art and yeah. installing them in a space and juxtaposing one object with another object. I and mean, that really is the idea of being a curator and understanding what inspires and informs the work that you choose. And my family is always greatly amused, you know, if I'm saying, oh, you know, I'm working with them. Oh. And they say, they say to me, what are you talking about? It's so simple. You go to an artist studio, you borrow the work, you install it in, you, in a room. <laughs> Why are you making so much fuss? And actually, although I, you know, I, I think the principle, the, they're right. The principle is a very simple one. But of course, the complexities, as everybody who knows who's involved in art of any period, it's really a, a, an extraordinarily fine-tuned kind of thinking and approach and attitude and sensibility, really. But I thought this might be a moment to look at some of the glorious uh, installations that I'm going to call it that you have in your previous house where you used to live um, and I thought that we would start here with um, these three principal pieces and I'm sorry that my picture is covering one of them and I wondered if you could if you could talk a little bit about one or all of the pieces and I mean one of the, before I before you begin to do that I think one of the things that's so interesting is that artists now may be visual artists, but they can also be filmmakers or writers or performers. I mean, Catherine Andrews, for example, is also a writer, but you have an object by her. And I wonder, what, do you have any, any of her writing as well, or, or do you, are you more interested in her three-dimensional work? With Catherine Andrews, I have... Uh... Two, uh, two sculptures, two three-dimensional work. Um, I'm really fascinated by her practice as, you know, as a conceptual artist, really conceptual. And this piece specifically with the ties, um, it's, it's not, I mean, it's an early piece by her. It's not particularly, uh, I think it's, a, it's very European and not so popish as her latest work. And I like that. I like the, 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 you know, the fact that in this installation relates to the other pieces also because it's fabric and it, the use of the ties. Some ties are fake. She made them quite large, extremely large. Some ties are, are really real. So the, the game that she plays, uh, the dichotomy between what's real and what's fake or, or what is manipulated, uh, especially in a place like Los Angeles. But then one of my favorite pieces in my collection is here and is um, Francis Stark, The Telephone Dress. Which and is the fantastic. Isn't it? It's spectacular. It's amazing. I love it. It's, it's really a piece that was, um, she wore during uh, a performance she did for Performa, uh, mm -hmm. the biennial, the performance biennial in New York City. And, uh, and I think there are two existing, no more. And, and, and it, it's, just, it's just a magical piece. And it, it, I don't know if the phone number in there, the phone number that she has in there is her actually, her phone number, but I have to ask, I never asked her. No, it's, but it's, again, it's part of a performance, but it's the object that remains of that performance. Yes. And behind her is uh, uh, Amanda Ross, who? And is a, is, a, is a quilt that she uh, commissioned her aunt to do with the remnants of, uh, of canvas pieces on the, on the floor of, uh, of her studios. So it's, it's, it's really, again, I mean, it's, 
uh, I don't know, women labor and, and stitching and it, craft. I love it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. And also for, for um, Amanda, I think, is, is, is American. She was born in Chicago and lives in Los Angeles. And for the Americans in particular, I think of quilting as such a specific skill and craft. And I was very interested to, to learn actually from Alvaro Barrington, who we work with here at the gallery, that um, from a piece that he did that we recently showed in, in uh, A Focus on Painting, about how quilters would hide maps to allow slaves to, to actually move from the south of the US to the north of the US. And so these incredibly qu incredible quilts, not only were they beautiful objects, but they were also objects that contained very important information, where the stars were, how they could travel through the extraordinary lengths um, and breadth of the US to freedom. I mean, it's, it's, it's something that, it's a subject I don't know so much about, but Obviously, it's wonderful to see contemporary artists taking that subject and then reinventing it for now. It's extraordinary. And this is, I think, just very close to your sitting room. That, that to, I'm yes. just going to go back to this one. It is, is, am I right that it's in the hallway? Or the hallway yes, this is the entrance, the entrance yes. hall. Yes, yes. And then here we have this spectacular view of your dining room, which has these two modernist chairs, which are absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> so obviously contemporary furniture or the f furniture of the 20th and 21st century is also very much something that you, you, you collect in addition to work by female artists. Yes, I mean, I'm interested in, uh, in design. I'm interested, I love fashion. I love furniture design. Uh, I would not consider probably myself a collector of design only because I've been buying design and furniture when I need to use them, you know, when I need a table and I, and I look into uh, table design by contemporary uh, designers, but it's not that I accumulate. And so really, but having said that, I'm really very sensitive to object we live with and i have a very specific aesthetic i'm very keen on the 70s i think the experimentation in design that happened in the 70s yes. i mean really put something new at the table and it was real progress then so i'm very keen on pieces by joe colombo uh, mario bellini gaetano pesce is one of my favorite also because his uh, sensitivity is that of an artist, yes. more than of the designer uh, or architect. He, he talks about and exercises figurative architecture, and, and his pieces are filled with life lessons and, uh, and life experiences. So, uh, but, but yes, I mean, I, I've been, I've been uh, exploring also for the new place that we are uh, living in, um, furniture design, women, you know, as, as designers and, and, and architects and furniture designers. So it's been a very interesting uh, and uh, exciting exercise as well. And I, and I commissioned some, uh, some intervention in the new house um, to Nathalie Dupasquet. So we are really very excited about those. It sounds absolutely thrilling, and um, I hope I might be able to, to come and see your incredible installation that now has developed even, is even more ambitious with, with furniture uh, and installations in the house. Yes, and, for sure. Thank you. I'm sorry to ask my, myself, and also uh, inappropriately on Instagram. However, <laughs> move, moving on. Um, the, um, in this room, I think you've got Julie Verhoeven um, and Nicole Eisenman, who was, of course, recently seen at the Whitechapel in Radical Painting, um, which was the most tremendous show and um, uh, such a talking point for, for so many people. But could you tell us a little more about the, the work in this room, your dining room? Yes, this work is Beer Garden. 
I think number one or number two, she, uh, Nicole made two of them, one in daylight and one at night. So this is the night one. And uh, I bought it a while ago uh, from my friend Barbara Weiss, the late Barbara Weiss. And, and um, I met actually the work of Nicole through Beatrix Roof when yes. she was at the Kunsthalle in, in Basel, I believe. And, uh, and I went to visit her and I got a pre-pre-preview while Nicole was installing uh, her show with uh, Leo Koenig, then her gallery. And, and then, so it, the show stayed with me, really. And, uh, and then after, after a few years, uh, I acquired this piece from, from Barbara. And and uh, and Casper told her, "Why did you sell it? It's a master. It's a masterpiece." Yes. And Barbara to told him, "It's in such a great hands." So, indeed. So, so, so here we go. I have this incredible. It's the magical piece. We sit at lunch, at dinner, at breakfast in uh, in uh, in this, at this table. We used to sit. And you always discover something else. It's such a rich and generous painting. And it, it's, a, it's a joy to look into it every morning and to discover new, new, new things. And so next to it, there is um, the Green Gentleman is by Francis U. Pritchard. And, and Francis is present in my collection with other pieces, but that's the Green Gentleman. And, there is no picture of the other, the other painting that the gentleman is facing, which is Lisa Yuskavage. Okay. So, and they are, and both, both Lisa's uh, blonde woman in the painting and also, and Francis Green Gentleman, they are in a, mo in a blissful moment, uh, how can I say, touching themselves. So <laughs> it's, really, it's really a funny, really combination or connection that happened magically because we didn't but we noticed later on that that was happening no, so these fun. magic things happen really and also i believe your your husband who, who works in finance you know he brings his his friends and his colleagues home to up to your house and and for them, this must be, this must create hilarious moments when they suddenly <laughs> realize what they're looking at. Hilarious. Yes, I mean, it's a, you know, a lot of people come in, in my place in terms of our friends, who not necessarily are, are collectors and, and, and or knowledgeable in any way about contemporary art. And I'm a very adventurous and, you know, person in terms of the pieces I collect. So we get comments constantly constantly and and it's uh, you know it, it, it it's fun but also it means that people really you push the boundaries of people I push the boundaries of my family of my husband as well of my children and um, and I really and I welcome uh, intelligent comments though and um, so this is obviously your sitting room um, and it includes the work by Elaine Lustig-Cohen. Uh, but tell us more. And also, it, it's wonderful to see that, you know, everything, there is a, you know, life is not tidy. And to see books piled, they're very, you know, organized. But nevertheless, you know, there are, there are things. Yes. There are, there's a feeling of looking at life as it is, you know, not, not as a yes. cleaned away, tidied away. Yes. Yes. I like... Uh, this is my style. I like when things are bold and I like bold artworks and artworks by women that are really strong and that they have strong voices. Uh, my style is quite bold and I and also uh, I, I like sense of humor. So also in the installation and in the works that I collect, there are always a sense of humor. And I don't like when you present artworks, it's not my, I mean, it's not my style, you present artworks, contemporary artists, uh, in a way that they are so detached from you and so precious. So this is why art is invading my space uh, and I welcome it. And it's really at, at human level. Um, 
And I, and I love books. I have a lot of art books uh, of my artists and I'm very proud of them. I support a lot. I supported a lot of publications by artists I support. And so this is a kind of like a story of my life. Well, but this is, uh, yeah. Yes, please, sorry. No, and then this, the X on the, on the, on the on top of the fireplace, uh, it's such an incredible painting and so much energy. And also it relates to the XX of my project in a way, but that's a connection that I, I realized later on. I didn't buy it for that reason. Um, then you have Sharon Hayes, the, the record sleeves of, uh, of President's uh, speeches uh, on the wall on the left. And then you have uh, uh, Anne Himoff, uh, uh, blue Lamborghini painting. Then on the, next to the next to the uh, the window you have uh, Francis U. Preacher the, the camel, uh, and in front on the on the sofa you have a, a bath mat by Julie Verhoeven with two breasts and and the, the feminine and the negative and the and the masculine side the yin and yang, and and she gave this to me. Uh, when we celebrated New Year's Eve together in this in my house uh, with a few other friends, and I thought it was uh, it was an apron. Instead, he told me no, it's actually for your for your bath. And, oh, uh, and obviously, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna use it as a bath mat. It's one of her soft sculpture that I really um, appreciate enormously. So, and this is an incredibly exciting time. Um, and you've created such an important space for female artists. But I would be fascinated to know how you're addressing gender fluidity. How are you thinking about this issue for the, the collection? And have you experienced a situation where an artist does not want to be labeled or categorized or defined by their gender? Can you imagine a time when you might broaden the collection's remit, for example, and perhaps a time when the collection also considers race and class in addition to gender? Well, yes. I mean, these are, these are all considerations that I navigate every day, you know, and as a, as a collector, as a patron, um, I always question what I do and, uh, and ask myself, how can I do it better? How can this be part of the times we are living in? And, um, and in terms of, you know, uh, non-binary artists, it's really, I've been, I've been questioning that. I haven't had the chance to, uh, to really formally engage into, into this, but there are a lot of artists in my collection that, they, you know, they don't consider themselves either a she or a he. So, and that's, you know, and that's, uh, and, 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 and that's uh, the reality, you know, the collection is in, uh, and also I am in. Um, I support, you know, women artists in museums and exhibition spaces, and, um, and, and yes, female versus male, but again, I don't question so much about, um, about you know, the, not the intention. I, Let's say that I haven't come across a, a moment where I, I find myself in a, in a corner and say, what do I do here? Uh, I've always been very, it's always been very fluid and very organic. And, um, and yes, I mean, these are always questions that I, that I face, especially right now. In terms of, uh, in terms of um, culture, and um, you know, race, identity. My collection uh, is is a is a personal journey with artists that come from all over the world, and they really come from every and any ethnicity. It's all art that I respond to, and so it's not trying to tick any boxes. It's really more: Do I respond to this practice? Do I respond to this type of work? And that's what I buy. Um, yes, I'm, I'm always very careful about, especially keeping a balance on, uh, on, on media, the type of media that I want to include, on geography, um, and, uh, and also a keen eye, and also you know, racial equality. But it's really quite a fluid, very spontaneous journey as well. 
Well, you 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 have so many relationships with artists, and of course, artists as guides, they're the best guides you can have. And I imagine that your com your com your conversations will touch on these topics as well as many others. So in in the changing world we live in, and my goodness me, it changes all the time. There's, I mean, at the moment it seems that every month is something new and something different and something to, to grapple with, really. Um, these conversations will be fascinating as they unfold and um, as they unfold for all of us. So I want to just now go on to the last image um, in your sitting room and this fantastic piece by Lily van der Stoker. 100% stupid. I remember her work. Of course, this is, I think, a piece from the 90s, 91. Um, we showed her when I was at the Southern Time. We showed her very early in the early 90s. So wow. almost a contemporary with that, with that piece. But tell us about other, other works in this room. I think there's Philida Barlow. Um, yes. And also wonderful, wonderful um, objects, vases by Gaetano. Gaetano. Yes. Yes. This is, uh, well, 100% stupid. It's a, it's a really very uh, important piece in the collection. It's the only wall painting I have. I love wall painting. Since, since buying this, this work, I mean, I could, it stayed installed for, I think, eight, ten years because I could not, I could not see that wall hosting any other artwork that appropriated the wall, the whole room actually. So 100% stupid, I, I, I went to Lily's studio in New York City when she was living there and I went and I stayed the whole afternoon and with her I went through all her drawings because she has, she starts from drawings and then they graduate to being installations, wall paintings and so she had incredible collection of them. And I chose that piece because to me, it spoke in so many ways about her conceptual practice, but also life. Yes. So the idea, the, the concept of stupidity, intelligence, beauty, ugliness, the fact that he's telling the audience, maybe you are 100% stupid or, <laughs> saying, or because you don't understand me, or he's yes. saying to himself, it's self-referential saying, I'm 100% stupid as a painting. Um, and, and so really I, I'm a big, a big fan of Lily's. I have many other pieces in my collection and that it, it was the starting point. The Filida Barlow um, watercolors under, right under it, um, it was a gift that I received from a Studio Voltaire because I hosted a dinner for Filida when, uh, when they had a show at, uh, at Studio Voltaire. It was the very beginning of her. I remember. Really, yes, yes. because the Serpentines was the, yes. the Serpentines I, were the, yeah. Yes, definitely. It was, um, well, I'm a huge fan of Joe's and the whole, you know, Studio Voltaire enterprise. Joe Scotland is a brilliant director and has carved a niche out for Studio Voltaire, which is really unlike any other space in London. And very often when I was at the Serpentine, I used to look to Studio Voltaire and say, oh, you know, mm -hmm. oh, respect. <laughs> <laughs> so I, yes. I'm, a big, I'm a big fan. And I can't believe, Valeria, that this, this 40 minutes has gone so quickly and we've come to the end. Oh, I really? Know. Already? <laughs> oh, okay. We've come to the end of our talk and I... I want to thank you so much for joining me and being so generous and letting us all see these amazing artists, the works you collected, how you've installed them, what has inspired you, how, what informs your thinking. And to say really chapeau, congratulations on thank everything you've you achieved. And I am so looking forward to the next stage, this new chapter, if I can put it like this, or chapters, because it's not only yeah. a to you too. And um, so thank you again very much for joining me. Thank you, Julia. It's been a real pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Anytime, anytime. You're welcome <laughs> for tea or drinks anytime. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now I'm going to go on to talk about what I'm doing next week or the week after. But um, and also to say that um, you can watch, rewatch all the teas with Julia on your um, or our IGTV or your YouTube channel. Today is the last day to view Oliver Beer's exhibition, 
Omer at Gallery Two Days Road back in London. Robert Rauschenberg's exhibition, Nightshades and Phantoms, opened this week at our gallery in the Marais, where you can also view Robert Wilson's exhibition. You can visit our Pantin Gallery in Paris also to see the FIAC highlights until 25th of October. Yan Pei Ming's exhibition, Against the Light, is on view in our gallery at, in Salzburg. And I look forward to seeing you for the next Tea with Julia, which is with Gabriele Finaldi, director of the National Gallery, on Saturday, the 7th of November at 11 a.m. And thank you.